Hello and welcome. Uh, coping with the millennials is a very interesting uh, challenge and uh, it's something that a lot of companies, organizations, particularly catering to the younger generation are coping with, uh, trying to understand what are the opportunities as well as what they need to do to gear up. To understand what this means and also how one could approach it from a thinking point of view, I'm joined by Rajendra Pawar, founder of NIIT, uh, both the training and the technologies company. Uh, Mr. Pawar, thank you very much for uh, joining Pleasure. us. So this is, a th uh, this is a theme that's been playing on your mind as I can see and, and for good reason because uh, the Millennials uh, are really uh, a constituency that your, uh, your your fortunes depend on in some ways so take us through some of the thoughts in your in your mind at this point so uh, you know it's first of all it's a little risky to brand correct generations but I guess since we deal with very large number of people in our uh, education business goes into millions and we have thousands of people in the software business coming from one to the other We've had, we've had to study this issue and understand it well. So I guess, you know, when we talk of the Gen Y or millennials or whatever term we use, uh, there is very definite difference that we are seeing in how they approach life and uh, how they view opportunity. And at the risk of kind of overgeneralizing, our own internal discussions indicate a few things. One is that this generation uh, is very um, very much more socially aware than the generation 10 years before right. them. So we call the previous generation the me generation, right? So this generation is not me generation. They are much more aware, sensitized to the environment around them. And therefore I would call them a we generation, much more than a me generation. And the immediate implications of that are that they, to them, knowing what's happening around them, immersing themselves in the environment, being sensitive, and therefore learning, if I may use the word, has a much higher premium to them than it had to the me generation, who we accused of being arrogant, money-minded, selfish, and so on. And this makes a big difference because this generation says, give me a challenging task to do. I want to, I've seen Mount Everest, I want to climb it. But let me tell you, I don't know how, and I'm willing to learn. And the older generation would have said? The old generation would say, I can go to 10,000 feet, and I, don't, don't, I know how, but I'll charge you an arm and leg. <laughs> that is the difference. So I think much more socially aware, much more keen to learn. And if you had to say that between two jobs, one gave more learning and less salary, and the other gave more salary and less learning, the previous generation would take the more salary, less learning. This one will ask for more learning and even be willing to pay to earn less salary. Right. So how is it manifesting itself in the way uh, organizations like yours are structuring uh, either their growth or their marketing or positioning? So let me talk of another point and then, we'll, then I'll respond to this answer. So this generation uh, is has much more intrinsic self-confidence and I guess that is coming out of the fact that in their formative years they've seen growth, growth, growth in the environment. So they are much more self-confident. And the previous generation was, let's say, a little, con little concerned about their jobs. So how does it translate to uh, aspects in our education business? So in education business, the, the youngster coming in today is not much, as much worried about, let's say, if he's in first year of college, of what will I do after I finish education? The previous generation was. So they are much more concerned about how do I embrace technology for my work today? How do I learn better? How do I educate myself better using technology? As against earlier on where they said, teach me technology so I can get a job. Right. So in a learning business, what it really means is that how to, uh, the word digital native is becoming, is becoming common, that these youngsters are growing up. But what does it mean to be to a digital native if I'm studying history and I don't know what I'm going to do in life? So what should I learn as skills to become a very efficient digital native on apps, for example, how to navigate the scope. If I have to do a project, earlier I would sit in the library and talk to people, how do I do a project which gives me resources which are unlimited. So what they're looking for is how, to, how do I use this new digital environment to succeed in what I'm doing today and to become sensitive about and the and environment. And that's the learning that they're seeking from you as so well. They're learning that, so that's what we see as the opportunity. Mm. And 10 or 15 years ago, they would come and say, I'm doing this ordinary graduation. 
give me something which can help me get a job at the end of three years. So this is a big difference in the learning business. So it's much more about how to get them empowered through this new world to do whatever they're doing very well and to get connected into society. For people who are in the workspace, I guess they are also looking at more challenges. They need more regular pat on the back, more feedback and the recognition. But as I said, you know, we announced a scheme in the, in the company that you can take time, four days of your time in a year, spend it on whatever you want as part of your freedom to contribute to society. And we can see what people are choosing. So these youngsters are much more aware of going into, you know, situations where there are, you know, challenges, social, economic challenges, than going and working there and spending the time, right? Not as much on, you know, becoming part of a music band or whatever. So in the workspace, it means that you have to create an environment where they can learn much more. You can create more challenges. You can give them shorter feedback on success. And you also provide opportunities where they get a satisfaction for being socially meaningful. I think this is a big difference going forward. And, and uh, so I'm assuming that as a company, NIT is, is doing some of this. A somewhat tangential question. You know, uh, your brand ambassador was Anand Vishwanathan. Is. Right? is sorry. Uh, Longest is. standing in, in the life of sports. And he represents people. a certain set of values. Yeah. Are they old or are they new? Um, so let's see. Over the years, what have we done? I think that will be a good way to look at it. So Vishy Anand, right in the beginning, we were saying that computers is all about logic, reasoning, thinking. Chess is about thinking, strategy, and so on and so forth. So the early connects were much more to do with this aspect. And I think as he became more and more famous and people asked him what ticks and what, what makes you tick and what makes you work. So he, uh, I think in his conversation with public, he, for example, felt that children in school time need to engage in deeper thinking. They need to think through many steps. They need to think, otherwise we think tactically. So actually, soon we started teaching chess in the schools where we do IT education. And that has become a very big movement. So now when he comes, and he, every year he, we do this competitions across the country and then it becomes district level, then all the way to zonal level, national. He plays with a few hundred chess players and we have we crossed a very interesting number of a million and a half kids who played chess for the first time oh. in the last seven years. So he's actually looking at now still using chess as a medium to engage children to build some capabilities which are good for their growth, not just about computers. Right, so, so that remains relevant to this day. Yeah, and, and I guess it's an interesting confluence as well of, uh, in some ways, uh, 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 a sport which is old world, mm -hmm. and as you say, the application continues to be. Uh, and and you're also saying that this is not something that Gen Y sees as a contradiction, and because it's not quick. I mean, it's it's not instant gratification in that sense. Well, if I were to see the uptake of chess in the school system, yeah. which is pretty much a singular objective that Vishy and us, we decided we should do. Because the challenge I had given to him is, okay, you become a grandmaster, what are you doing for the country? So he said, let's bring chess back to India, literally. So what we find is the, and maybe it's not just about the game, it's about competing, it's about engaging, it's about getting recognition, it's about playing with Vishy. Some of those habits don't change. People still look up to role models. And he's an outstanding role model. All so, the good values. So. Yeah. We are seeing more and more, uh, you know, out of chess as against sort of computers. Yeah, yeah. So that, I mean, there was a sort of brief tangential, uh, and not so tangential perhaps, because it's yeah. really connected to what you're trying to do with the millennials. Yeah, it's all about the mind. Is what it's all about say. the mind. So, uh, what's the sort of millennial three-point strategy, if there is one, uh, going to be for uh, the near future and, and and the way you're going to approach it? So, for our education business, I think it is about making a shift to this new connected world. Uh, which is easy because that's about technology and social media. But more important is the shift to what's the priority of this community. And so therefore, if they are much more socially aware, that has to find a place in the curriculum. Correct? Right. If they are looking at learning with hunger, then giving the world's learning resources to them and building a capability that they can navigate it very clearly. If it's about collaborating, 
then for example nothing stops us and we are doing these experiments that you have a project and you have two students from NIT China, one from NIT Africa, one from Karnataka and one from Kerala. Collaboration at a global level. So we, and so because they're also global. So we have to adjust to this new environment and then rework, and which we are doing, our offering. So they're much more online, much more global, much more, co much more connected, much more relevant. This is in the learning business. In the software business, it basically means that when we hire young people, we have to create a setting which is much more collaborative, much more open, where we recognize their need to learn and give them time and space, where we do more frequent recognition on a peer basis. They don't want just a big boss to tell someone. So we do now, you know, who's the smartest in your group is a collaborative peer level selection. And that's interesting. So, so you're saying a, a bunch of 21-year-olds could decide between them who's the best they amongst do them? very good decisions. We, okay. So this 360-degree appraisal, which we have, our mechanism yeah. we had built for HR, now when we do our annual day function, we have a lot of, uh, you know, a lot of competition, should we say. Who's the best dressed? Who's this? Who's an active learner? And they, they, they poll and they see great value in it. So we have to create a working environment which sees this need. And that working environment is the change we have to make in IHR policies. Right, uh, Mr. Pawar, thank you so much and uh, for sharing your billennial theory and your objectives for NIIT. Thank Thanks you very so much. much.